Cuba, with its bottle green mountains, diamond dust beaches, and perfectly preserved colonial cities, Cuba is enchantingly picturesque. It also boasts a fascinating history, enthralling museums, and a lively culture of music and dance. Cuba is the largest of the Caribbean island. Its diverse landscape spans the pristine coral reefs at Jardín de la Reina to cloud-draped mountains in the Sierra Maestra, and everything in between. Dive in tropical seas, cycle through the Valle de Viñales, or look for birds in the Parque Nacional Ciénaga de Zapata. Until as recently as 5,500 years ago, postcard-pretty villages throughout the island still resound to the crowing of roosters and clip-clop of hooves, made even more romantic by a lack of commercialism. Before we start, let's take a moment to explore the intriguing history of Cuba. It has had a tumultuous history owing to its strategic location as the key to the New World. The island's colorful colonial past is shadowed by slavery and a passionate quest for independence. But following the revolution, Cuba became a world leader in literacy, healthcare, and music. Until as recently as 5,500 years ago, the island of Cuba appears to have been uninhabited. The first settlers were hunter-gatherers who lived in caves. Around 1,500 years ago, the Taino arrived from the Orinoco Basin in South America. They developed a more advanced culture, living in tribal units and becoming skilled farmers, potters, and weavers. However, the peaceful Taino culture was swiftly decimated following the landing Christopher Columbus on the shores of Cuba on 27 October 1492. The first settler expedition followed in 1511. Those Taino not put to the sword for resisting Spanish subjugation succumbed to European diseases, and within a century, the native population had perished. In 1553, Havana was named Cuba's capital. Vast treasure fleets passed through the city's harbor on their way to Spain, resulting in regular attacks by pirates and privateers. Castles and fortresses were built in Cuban cities for protection, while forests were felled for precious timber. A significant slave trade also evolved at this time. Spain's monopolistic treatment of Cuba inspired several revolts. In 1762, a British fleet captured Havana and lifted Spain's trade restrictions. Although the conquest was brief, this change caused a surge in trade with North America and a rapid expansion of sugar plantations, and in consequence, the slave trade. By the mid-1800s, Cuba had become the world's largest supplier of sugar, and Havana was more sophisticated than Madrid, which is the capital city of Spain nowadays. By 1826, all of Spain's Latin American colonies, apart from Puerto Rico and Cuba, had gained independence. Spain ruled Cuba to its own benefit with indifference to local sentiment. On 10 October 1868, planter Carlos Manuel de Céspedes freed his slaves and launched a war of independence which is the well-known Ten Years' War in which white and black locals fought side by side. Although Generals Máximo Gómez and Antonio Maceo liberated much of Cuba, the uprising was brutally suppressed and one-fifth of the population were killed. In 1895, a second war was launched and by 1898 the independence fighters were close to victory when a U.S. warship exploded in Havana's harbor. The U.S. had long coveted Cuba and, blaming Spain, declared war. Spain was vanquished and the U.S. military administered Cuba until independence was granted in 1902. U.S. entities came to own more than 50% of the Cuban economy and Washington, D.C. tolerated a series of corrupt presidents as long as they supported U.S. economic interests. In 1933, Fulgencio Batista, who is the former president of Cuba, seized power in the Sergeant's Revolt. At first, he enacted progressive reforms and was elected president. After retiring to Florida, he seized power again in 1952, granted the Mafia free reign, and imposed a brutal dictatorship to which the U.S. turned a blind eye. Fidel Castro, a 26-year-old lawyer, launched the revolution to topple Batista with an attack on the Moncada barracks in Santiago de Cuba on 26 July 1953. It failed miserably, but Batista caved in to popular support and granted Fidel and his brother Raul amnesty. This proved to be a fateful error as the Castros left for Mexico to organize a rebel army. 
On 2 December 1956, Fidel Castro and 81 others, including Che Guevara, who is the signature figure of Cuban Revolution, and nowadays his face is always printed on T-shirt as a souvenir of Cuba. On 31st of December 1958, after Che Guevara's guerrilla force captured the city of Santa Clara, Batista fled Cuba. Fidel Castro and leaders of several other revolutionary groups had agreed on a civil government. But Fidel usurped, seized power, and embracing communism, enacted radical reforms to rid Cuba of racism, poverty, illiteracy, and unequal health care. He negotiated the support of the Soviet Union and manipulated a break with the U.S. In retaliation, President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was the U.S. president at that time, imposed the U.S. embargo on Cuba in 1960. The U.S. also sponsored an invasion by Cuban-American exiles on 17 April 1961 at the Bay of Pigs. Following this failed coup, the U.S. launched Operation Mongoose, with the aim to rid Cuba of Castro once and for all. Stalemate was the result, however, as Castro asked the Soviet Union to install nuclear missiles on the island as a deterrent. The Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 was only resolved when President Kennedy promised not to invade Cuba. Fidel Castro was now free to pursue his dreams. The Great Literacy Campaign eradicated illiteracy, and education and health care were extended to the entire country. But, as every business was nationalized, the economy tanked and Cuba became entirely dependent on the Soviet Union for its supplies. When the Soviet bloc collapsed in 1991, Cuba entered the special period of extreme economic crisis and turned to tourism to save the day. In 2006, Fidel Castro fell gravely ill and handed power to his younger brother Raul, who in 2011 initiated far-reaching economic reforms to stimulate private enterprise. That same year, President Barack Obama expanded travel opportunities by lifting restrictions against U.S. citizens visiting Cuba. In 2015, the two countries formally re-established diplomatic relations, and in March 2016, President Obama became the first president since Calvin Coolidge in 1928 to visit Cuba. Fidel died on 25 November 2016, two weeks after Donald Trump was elected president. In 2017, Trump reinstated many restrictions on Cuba. In April 2018, almost 60 years of Castro rule came to an end when Raul stepped down as Cuban president. He was replaced by a civilian, Miguel Diaz-Canel. After gaining insight into Cuba's history, we can explore its present state. Havana, Cuba's animated capital city lives up to its international reputation as a captivating time warp. While much of La Habana Vieja, which is the enchanting colonial quarter, has been restored to elegant grandeur, the rest of Havana's evocative urban center has changed little since the 1950s. Classic American cars rumble past stunning buildings in a mesmerizing amalgamation of styles, from Art Nouveau to Art Deco. The best place to begin your exploration of Havana is at its foundation site, E.L. Template, which sits in La Habana Vieja's cobbled Plaza de Armas. E.L. Template is small and austere. This neoclassical building, resembling a temple, stands on the spot where the city was founded in 1599. Here is the first meeting of the local government and the first mass reputedly took place. However, the must-see attraction must be the Palacio de los Capitanes Generales. This grand palace, which was once the seat of the Cuban government, offers an overview of the history of Havana, with exhibits reflecting both Cuba's grand colonial past and the island's struggle for independence. Construction of the Palacio de los Capitanes Generales, a splendid example of Cuban Baroque, took place from 1776 to 1791. It was commissioned by the governor Felipe Fondesviela and designed by engineer Antonio Fernández de Trebejos y Saldívar. The palace originally housed the Spanish governor's residence and a house of detention, which until 1834 occupied the West Wing. The seat of the Cuban Republic from 1902, the building became the city museum in 1967 but the original structure of the sumptuous residence and political center has not been altered. Take a tour of the hallowed rooms and admire the artifacts on display, from 18th century devotional objects to late 19th century makeshift cannons. 
One of the capital's oldest streets, Calle Oficios, is among only four in existence from the end of the 16th century. It was originally a link between the military center of Plaza de Armas and Plaza de San Francisco, the city's commercial hub. Together with Calle Obispo, this is one of the most atmospheric streets in Old Havana, and most of the facades date from the 18th and 19th centuries. The street is bisected by the Plaza de San Francisco. At the intersection, you will find a bronze statue of El Caballero de Paris, who roamed Havana's streets in the 1950s, engaging passers-by in discussions about philosophy and politics. North of the plaza is the 18th-century Casa de los Arabes. It displays 18th and 19th-century Hispanic Arab bronzes, fabrics, rugs, and furniture in three permanent and two temporary exhibitions rooms. This ethnographic display of Arab objects serves as evidence of the presence of an old Lebanese, Syrian, and Palestinian colony in Cuba. South of Plaza de San Francisco is the Coche Mambi, a handsome green and white train coach dating from 1900. For several decades from 1912, it served as the official railway accommodation for presidents of Cuba. Visitors can board to look at the plush reception room, dining rooms and lounge which all have dark wood paneling, and the neatly fitted bedroom and kitchen. A symbol of the city, the capital combines the elegance of neoclassicism with art deco elements. After an extensive renovation, in 2018, it returned to its original role as the seat of Cuba's government. Standing in an area once occupied by a botanical garden and later by the capital's first railway station, the capital is a loose imitation of that in Washington, D.C., but is even taller. The dome was the highest point in the city until the 1950s. During Machado's rule, the building witnessed many major historic events and after the revolution, it became the headquarters of the Ministry of Science, Technology and the Environment. For the visitors who love walking around the city, Paseo del Prado will be one of the good options. The most picturesque boulevard in Havana is popular with locals at any time of the day. It's perfect for a gentle stroll and gossip in the shade of the trees, and at sunset, it becomes a lively haunt. Along this majestic promenade, you'll find some of Havana's grandest buildings, including historic hotels that inspired novels, as well as theaters and mansions. Although many of these are in a state of disrepair, they retain their charm. Tourists visiting Cuba often feel like they have traveled back several decades due to the ubiquitous presence of classic American cars throughout the city. From open-topped Ford Model Ts from the 1920s to the stylish Ford Thunderbird or T-Bird of the 1950s, classic American cars add to Cuba's time-warped splendor. You'll find cars that are eight decades old on Cuba's roads, with nearly one in six predating the revolution. These four-wheeled survivors of a bygone era are kept running by their resourceful owners, despite decades of U.S. embargoes. Many serve as taxis, and some offer sightseeing tours. Cuba is famous for its cigar. If you are cigar lover, Real Fabrica de Tabacos Partagas is the place you can't miss out. Cuba's largest cigar factory, with its neoclassical facade, is a good example of 19th-century industrial architecture. It was founded in 1845 by the ambitious Catalan businessman Jaime Partagas Ravelo, who never revealed the sources of his tobacco leaves or how they were processed. In fact, the only information that survives is that he was the first person to use wooden barrels to ferment the leaves in order to heighten the aroma. With the profits made from his high-quality cigars, Partagas bought a plantation in the province of Pinar del Rio. He wanted to oversee all aspects of the cigar-making process personally, from growing the plants to the placing of a wrapper leaf around the filler and binder leaves rolled. However, Partagas was assassinated in mysterious circumstances and the project failed. His factory was then purchased by another shrewd businessman, Ramon Cifuentes Llano. Visitor can join the tour of this cigar factory, which is fun and educational. On the tour, you will see dozens of people at work in the aroma-filled interior. Nowadays, there is no longer someone reading aloud to alleviate the monotony of the work by entertaining and educating the workers, as was the case in the 19th century. This custom was introduced by Partagas himself. But there is a loudspeaker that alternates reading passages with music and news on the radio. Connected to the factory is La Casa de Habano, which is an excellent shop with a back room that is used for sampling cigars. 
The other famous brand of cigar, Fabrica de Tabacos H. Upman, the name of H. Upman, who was a German who settled in Cuba in 1844 and founded the eponymous cigar brand. This factory was in fact built in 1914 by Cuesta Rey and Puanacobrae, whose name adorns the gable. Confusingly, locals refer to it as the Fabrica El Rey del Mundo, a cigar brand previously made at this site or Fabrica Romeo y Julieta, a name it earned when it was nationalized. As of 2015, the factory was renamed Fabrica Antonio Briones Montoto, after a revolutionary hero, but few use this name today. As with all Cuba's state-run cigar factories, this factory produces a variety of different brands, but its tours set it apart from La Corona Cigar Factory and Real Fabrica de Tabacos Partagas, the other two fabricas which are open for visits in Havana. The tour takes in the sorting room, packaging room, and rolling room, where you can peer over the shoulders of the rollers and see workers grading tobacco. Great experience for cigar lover again. Cigars were used by the indigenous Indians and are now an inextricable part of Cuba's culture and history. After Columbus's voyage, tobacco, then regarded in Europe as having therapeutic qualities, was imported to Spain and later the rest of the world. Cigar manufacturing is a real skill that Cubans hand down from generation to generation. The tobacco plant is harvested between November and February. The leaves are tied in bunches and then dried in barns for 45 to 60 days. They are then transported to a factory where a cigar roller makes them into cigars. The wrapper leaf is rolled around the filler leaves, which have been selected for their flavor. This in turn is covered by the smooth leaf on the outside of the cigar. The cigar is then trimmed. The Chinese quarter of Havana, the Barrio Chino, now occupies a small area defined by Calais San Nicolas, Dragones, Zanja, and Rayo. Its heyday was during the early 1900s, when Barrio Chino was home to around 10,000 Chinese people. It was the largest Chinatown in Latin America. The bustling area contained numerous Chinese businesses, including four Chinese-language newspapers, as well as community and cultural associations, which ran communal spaces such as the Chunghua Casino. Much of the Cuban Chinese population left after the Cuban Revolution in 1959, when businesses were nationalized by the communist government. Today, Barrio Chino is more of a historical record than a thriving Chinatown. All the Chinese shops are concentrated in the so-called Cuchillo de Zanja area. The architecture is not particularly characteristic, except for the quarter gate, which is topped by a pagoda roof. Another, much more impressive portico, in the Ming and Qing styles, was constructed in 1998 at the corner of Calle Dragones and Calle Amistad. It is almost 19 men in wide and was donated to Cuba by the Chinese government. The first Chinese people arrived in Cuba in the mid-1800s to work in the sugar industry and were treated like slaves. Eventually gaining their freedom, they began to cultivate small plots of land in Havana. And in one of these, they grew Cuba's first mangoes. This fruit was an immediate and spectacular success with the local population. Chinese restaurants began to appear in the area after the second wave of Chinese immigrants arrived from California, armed with their American savings. While maintaining their own cultural traditions, the Chinese community has embraced their Cuban identity, sharing in the island's lot and contributing to its development. A black granite column at the corner of Calle Linea and Calle El remembers the Chinese who fought for Cuban independence. How do you feel after learning so many things about Cuba? Do you just want to get set go to plan a trip to Cuba? Before the trip, please take a look at the description. Some travel tips and practical information are left there. I apologize in advance for not being able to cover all of the tourist destinations in Cuba, as there are countless captivating places in this historically rich country. If you have any questions regarding traveling in Cuba, or if you would like to learn more about specific locations within Cuba or other countries, please don't hesitate to leave a comment below. I will try to make a video for you guys with my team.